36 dedicated people in here. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about is how derivatives work. Why are they, why are they different compared to traditional finance and understanding how they impact the market as well as developing a system to interpret them as well as leverage them. Um, the main flashy things that you see with derivatives, you always see these headlines. $3 billion in crypto longs liquidated as Ethereum drops to 3000 Really flashy headlines, um, but you have to understand that liquidations are kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So once they start, it's a positive feedback loop where you're going to get more liquidations. By understanding derivatives, you might, you might be able to uh, architecture a way to capture 62% 62% on an annual basis by going long on sheep. If you understand how derivatives work, you would be able to capture that risk-free premium. And by the end of this lecture, you will be you will, you will be able to interpret these bars on the bottom, right? The this one in the middle is open interest and this one on the bottom is spot or funding rate, sorry. AKA interpret this data. Uh, the three most important data pieces for derivatives, open interest, funding rate, and liquidations. Basically three different pieces of data. And why do we care about derivatives? Uh, the volume is significantly higher than spot volume. Um, spot markets have a soft ceiling of liquidity. Um, FTX kind of broke this soft ceiling, but in theory, the spot market for Bitcoin is limited by the number of Bitcoin that exists. I will be posting this on YouTube later and this Google Slides will be available in the Discord immediately after. I think the TikTok recording will be, it takes a while, but everything will be posted. But yeah, spot markets have a soft ceiling. Bitcoin can only be traded if there's actually physical Bitcoin in the exchange more or less by and large. And um, the market is quickly evolving a preference for derivatives. But why is the market deliver de developing a preference for derivatives? So these are the top derivative exchanges. Number six, Deribit. Number five, BitGet. Number four, OKX. Number three, Bybit. Number two, Binance. Number one, CME. You've probably heard of two through six. But I am pretty sure most of y'all have not heard of number one. Number one is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It is a traditional finance institution, i.e. it is not crypto native. These other ones are crypto native. They started in crypto and then they added derivatives, right? So we have an outsider. An outsider has wiggled his way into number one cryptocurrency derivatives provider. That is concerning. This is a chart uh, from CryptoQuant, um, from CryptoQuant. Um, basically what it's showing is the ratio, the ratio between spot and derivatives. Uh, so this blue line, this blue line that goes up and then goes down is the ratio between spot and derivatives. And so right now the ratio is sitting at 0.9, or sorry, 0 0.09. So the ratio between spot and derivatives is 0 0.09, meaning there's over 10 times the derivatives volume in the crypto ecosystem than spot volume. That is significant. So that means when you when you look at the volume, the spot volume of a traded asset, you are only getting roughly one tenth of the picture. And do you think it's okay to only stand only understand one tenth of the picture? Do you think that's okay? The answer is no. That's why we're learning about it. Um, so why do futures exist? Number one, and most importantly, they allow for access of leverage. Because when you're trading a derivative, you're not trading the backing asset, you're trading contracts. And because you're entering the world of a synthetic asset, you can leverage up. So you could turn $1 into $10 of buying power, 10x leverage, meaning that if it goes up 10%, you make 100%. If it goes down 10%, you get a liquidation. Another benefit is that it has enhanced liquidity and depth relative to spot, more leverage, more liquidity, plain and simple. It also allows people to trade outside normal hours, more so in the traditional markets. Uh, it empowers future asset mispricing, and it is uh, really like trading futures, offering futures is a very, very, very good business model. 
It exists because it is a good business model. Everything else is pretty much second. Good morning, I am him. We're talking about crypto derivatives. We just started seven minutes ago, so don't worry, you're not late. The exchanges that offer cryptocurrency derivatives, they are the casino. 100%. They are taking by and large bets that they are going to win more than 50% of the time. Plain and simple. The other thing that's important to know is a lot of the times the exchanges counter trade you. It came out in the FTX discovery that they were openly counting counter trading their users. Robinhood does the same. Robinhood does the same. Robinhood sells user information to Citadel. Citadel counter trades Robinhood users. Binance does the same. The exchange is the casino and the user is the gambler. By and large, the gambler loses. Um, there's multiple derivatives products. Dated futures, those are typically found in traditional markets, so like oil, orange juice, copper, silver, that kind of stuff. Uh, perpetual futures are the flagship product of cryptocurrency, and last but not least, options. Yeah, like I said, they're common in traditional markets, not really common in crypto. Um, they typically expire in a couple months and the holder is expected to take delivery. So if you buy an orange juice contract, you better get ready to accept a delivery of a ton of orange juice. Uh, Bitcoin futures contracts are available via the CME. Good morning, Claire. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Um, I included a link to this in the Google slide. This is a resource for the CME futures. So um, basically you can use this website to get a gauge on how Wall Street is feeling. Are they bullish? Are they bearish? Um, as a general broad census statement, they are usually overly bullish and overly bearish. So you'll find their price predictions on a three month basis, usually pretty wacky. So I pulled this last week, but basically the way to interpret this is um, January, 2024, like this, this column in the middle, the white column here, they are expecting Bitcoin to be trading at 38K at 38k um, there's another resource here a velo traditional finance data so just looking at the top left this is cme future interest this is cme futures volume the cme second month annual basis is the premium between now and the second month so basically it takes um what they expect price to be in the second month versus now they divide it so if they said bitcoin was going to be uh, let's say 40k and bitcoin was currently at 30k the annualized basis would be 10 percent um, so this is really useful because it basically is a graph that conceptualizes just how bullish wall street is or how not bullish wall street is if the second if the annualized basis is positive right if this line in the top right is positive that means wall street is bullish if it is negative they are bearish what percentage difference do they expect the price to be in two months um yeah does anyone know who this man is i'm curious i know a lot of people in tiktok have only gotten into crypto in the last three years but i am curious if anyone knows who this man is 35 people in here we're talk. we have a live lecture talking about cryptocurrency derivatives bitcoin currently trading forty three thousand three hundred and thirty dollars Good morning, Nikwa Westwa. Nikwa Westwa, good morning. Good morning, Vic. How we doing, my friend? Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Claire. Good morning, Stop Loss. He owns an exchange, I think. He used to. He used to own an exchange. This man is a crypto pioneer. I'm curious. I'll give it another 10 seconds. I'm curious if anyone knows his name. Who is this man? Oh. His name is Arthur Hayes. It's Vitalik Buterin. His name is Arthur Hayes, and he's the founder of BitMEX. BitMEX was the first major cryptocurrency derivatives exchange, and with that, he basically created a new asset class called Perpetual Futures, or PERPS, as they call them in the streets. So Perpetual Futures, or PERPS, are contracts that never expire. So before we were talking about future contracts that had a set delivery date, well, perpetuals never expire. Um, they existed kind of before, but they became much more popular in the crypto market with BitMEX. BitMEX was the first perpetual exchange. Um, it allowed users to leverage up to 100x their money. It added an insane amount of money into the crypto ecosystem. And again, very, very, very profitable business, right? The only thing better than a casino is a casino that gives their players 10 times leverage. 
it's true um, so effectively the main benefits here is you can borrow a lot of money and all fees are multiplied by the amount of money you borrow so if you take a maker fee of 0.075 percent that 0.075 percent is multiplied by 100 you know what i mean and exchanges often counter trade you they know the gamblers often lose binance ftx citadel Robinhood, they all counter trade you so first we're going to talk about liquidations what are liquidations why do they matter um, these these headlines are always so flashy and I have no idea why 3 billion in crypto longs liquidated over 1 billion in crypto market liquidations over 200 million dollars in crypto futures bets liquidated although this this is how you can tell we're still in a bear market in the bull market we were liquidating 3 billion dollars in positions that is literally exchanges making 3 billion dollars right if the exchange liquidates you they make that money so another way to rephrase this top news story here, exchanges make $3 billion instantly. It's a really good business model. Something to think about, right? One person's loss is another person's win in the world of derivatives. It is very much a player versus player market. Uh, liquidation forced to close a position. And the reason you are forced to close, an exchange will never let you an exchange will never let you exceed 100% loss, ever, unless you are Caroline Ellison. Gary Wang described FTX Alameda Research its special privileges within months of founding FTX. Alameda's accounts were running a negative balance as early as late 2019. Eventually, Alameda's line of credit was set at $65 billion, effectively giving them free access to all customer funds on the exchange. So, exchanges will liquidate you the second, the second that you come close to 100% loss. FTX allowed Alameda to go over 100% loss. Good morning, Carl Dupe. We're just talking about cryptocurrency derivatives. We are 15 minutes into a Google Slideshow. The Google Slideshow is being recorded and will be shared in the Discord immediately after. Um, so liquidations is a forced close. And when there's a, if you are short, the way you close a short is you buy right? You sell something, you need to buy it. And if you're long, you need to sell something. Um, and so sudden and unexpected price movements can cause extreme volatility, right? So if everyone is short on the market and the market suddenly pumps up, not only do those shorts get liquidated, those shorts have to buy pushing the price further up. What could be called a squeeze, right? A squeeze. So let's say everyone is short the price suddenly goes up, all of those shorts get liquidated, they have to pump further to close them. And so it naturally enhances volatility. It is a self-reinforcing cycle. Once the liquidations begin, it's self-reinforcing. Something to think about. Derivatives greatly enhance natural volatility. She didn't have a stop loss because she didn't have liquidation points. Yeah, a lot of things going on there. Um, so a great example of a short squeeze, GameStop, right? We all, we all heard about GameStop. We all heard about GameStop. One of the most legendary short squeezes of all time. The short interest, I think, was like up to like 40% at one point. Um, and that means everyone was betting on the price going down. But when the price starts going up, lo and behold, the people who have shorts are not only in a losing position, but they have to buy and push the price up higher. So that's a short squeeze. A great example of a long squeeze is when Terra Luna went to zero. Terra Luna went really high, really fast. Everyone was long. There was a huge amount of open interest rising. And then the FUD began. The FUD began, UST became depegged, and everyone that was long had to sell, and the price went to zero. So just in the same note, there is long squeezes, there is short squeeze. Dude, Luna Classic has been pumping recently though. Bitcoin, 43,600. Thank you for the update, Ryan. Thank you. Um, so that is the concept of liquidations, right? They, liquidations naturally enhance cryptocurrency volatility. Uh, what we're gonna talk about now is open interest. Um, so Coinalize, again, these are all bookmarks that will be available if like, if I, if I were just to click here, if you were to just click here, 
uh, it would take you to the link. Um, so Open Interest, CoinAlliance, great resource for it. Um, so you can see middle of the screen, all $11.9 billion of total interest, $10.9 billion of our perpetuals, and $1 billion of it are standard futures products. Another way that it is looked at is as a bar along the bottom. So this is on VLO data, VLO data. But you might notice this is also for Bitcoin. So this chart said Bitcoin had almost $12 billion in open interest, while this chart says Bitcoin only has 200K new camera bad. I don't think, dude, I don't think this camera is bad. Um, well, this chart says 200K. And so the difference is, is that this chart on Coinalyze is priced in dollars. It is priced in dollars, specifically US dollars. While this chart is priced in Bitcoin. So this chart says there's $12 billion in open interest. This, will, oh, this one says 200,000 Bitcoin. It's the same value, but it's a different expression. So you can value open interest in dollars, or you can value open interest in the reference assets. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, etc. Something to think about because 200K is a very different number than 12 billion. So you have to understand what is the asset we are talking about. Again, dollars, Bitcoin. Reference asset or dollar denominated value. Personally, I prefer dollar denominated value because it's easier to understand versus if someone tells me there is, I don't know, 100 million Ethereum in open interest, you got to do some math to kind of come to the conclusion to understand how much it is. Um, behavior of degenerates. Perpetual futures greatly accentuate the volatility of the market. They make the highs higher and the lows lower. Um, because people join into trends late on high leverage, it tends to push the price higher. And then when they get liquidated, it pushes the price even lower. Um, there is no way, when you look at just open interest and liquidations, there is no way to determine directionality. Directionality is the bias, right? Are more people long? Are more people short? There is no way to determine directionality. Open interest is just a value concept. How much money is being used in the derivatives ecosystem? Here's a great example. So this was yesterday, actually. This was yesterday. Yes, Bitcoin currently trading $43,600. We'll do some live analysis after this chart. Bitcoin just touched 44K. That it did. We like the 44K Bitcoin. We'll do some live analysis after, guys. I got to get through this. So this was this was actually this was yesterday, right? So Bitcoin broke structure, right? We're starting with this top, top graph that's price. Bitcoin broke structure. Price started exploring upwards and then the DGENs joined in. You can see uh, with this open interest along the bottom, there is a massive spike in open interest. Open interest went from 7.6 billion to 8.3 billion. That means $700 million worth of derivatives joined in on the trade. That is a lot of money. $700 million joined in once Bitcoin broke structure. Like I said, open interest just accentuates volatility. The other thing, perpetuals tend not to last. So for example, price started rising. Price started rising, but open interest was rising while price was flat. So in this instance, open interest was front running price. So it was derivatives pushing this price up. The movements led by open interest tend to revert. So if you see Bitcoin trading flat while open interest is rising, that's kind of a warning sign because that means derivatives are taking positions, but it is all contextualized by spot volume. So in this instance, price was rising, spot volume was flat, but open interest was rising. That tells you that people are not buying spot, people are buying derivatives instead, and that you're probably gonna round trip. And that's exactly what happened. There was an infusion of spot volume on the bottom here, but it was too little, too late, price reverted back down. So if you see a high amount of open interest, but a low amount of spot volume, that is a red flag. That is a red flag moves that last tend to be led by spot volume. So here's another great example. This was also on the move yesterday. This is the exact same chart, the exact same chart, just a different time frame. Um, so this move right here, look at this white line. Look at this white line here. There was a major spot volume candle 
a major spot volume candle right before this price started. So this pump yesterday was started with spot volume, started with spot volume, price started rising, and then open interest came in. Look at this white line, right? This white line is what matters. To the left of it, there is a high amount of spot volume, price started rising, and then the degenerates joined in after the fact, right? Right, look at this candle, or this white line, sorry. To the right side, the degens joined after the move had already started. The open interest didn't start the move, it joined. Um, spot volume presence suggests continuation. You could understand spot volume as the primary driver, while an absence of spot volume suggests trend exhaustion. Uh, open interests act to accentuate volatility, fuel to the fire, kind of like pouring lighter fuel on a fire. It's fun, but it doesn't last forever. Uh, spikes of OI near support or resistance don't hold as well as spot as support, as support or resistance. What about directionality? So we were talking about open interest. It's impossible to determine if Bitcoin is going up or Bitcoin is going down, purely looking at open interest. Open interest is a value concept. How much money is in the ecosystem? But what we can look at is funding rate. Funding rate. Um, so what does it mean when there is negative 150% APR? Does anyone actually know what this means? Negative 150% APR. What does this mean? Like there's no way you can not, you can like lose 150%, right? It doesn't quite make sense. Overborrowed, exactly. So this could be best understood as the premium to short the asset. We'll talk about it. Um, you, you market order into a trade. You incur a 0.075% taker fee. You are leveraged 25x. You hold this position for eight hours and you incur a 0.0% .0 funding rate. Before you even before even considering price movement, yeah, I can turn down music. That's a good call, actually. Before I, before you even consider any price mu movement, you are already down two percent. You are already down two percent of your total size. Two percent. This is why trading futures, if you are inexperienced or don't know what you're doing, is a losing game right all of the fees all of the fees that you pay are amplified by the amount of leverage that you take oh up and down arrows move volume on the youtube oh there we go you're teaching me something stop loss so the higher the leverage the higher the fees plain and simple um when we're talking about asset pricing and derivatives there's what is called the spot price which is a global average price for the asset um, that's where oracles come in. That's where oracles come in. So a major value proposition of oracles is getting price feeds to exchanges. Uh, while well, the mark price is the local exchange price that includes derivatives. But what happens when the spot price is different than the mark price? Because the spot price is the global average. The mark price is the local, the local exchange price. This is a great example. So the white, the white bar, The, the white bars is the global average price. The global average price. And so effectively, what this graph is showing you is that there is two prices for an asset at any given time. There is what is called the price index or the spot price. And there's what is called the futures price or the mark price. And so there's two prices for assets at any given time when you're talking about derivatives. This is another way to encapsulate it. Bitcoin current currently flying 44k. Yeah, it's currently trading $43,300. Love to see it. Because of this country never helped young generation. I'm helping young generations right now, bro. Um, and effectively, the difference between the two prices can be expressed as a percentage expressed as a percentage. So this purple line in the middle is zero. But you see like sometimes this blue line is positive. Sometimes this yellow line is negative. Sometimes it's positive. This is the percentage difference between the spot price and the mark price. Percentage difference. That is what that is what is funding rate. So when the mark price is above the spot price, 
Mark price is the derivatives price. Spot price is the actual price. That means there's a premium to long the asset, right? Because if, if the mark price is above the spot price and you go to long, that means you are making that difference bigger. You are going to incur a fee for doing so, right? Because effectively you are adding to the inefficiency. The easiest way to understand an inefficiency is asset miss pricing. So longs are going to pay a premium when the mark price is above the spot price, but one person's trash is another person's treasure. So in that situation where spot price is, I don't know, let's say 30 K mark price is 31, 31 K just for simplicity sake, longs would pay a premium, but shorts would get a rebate, right? Because shorts are on the other side of that equation. Spot price is here. Mark price is here. That means if there's like, I don't know, a 0.1% difference, there's a 0.1% difference on either side of the equation. So that means longs would pay shorts 0.1%, right? That is the rebate. That is when the mark price is greater than the spot price. You can be on either side of this equation, right? I know it is a whole bunch of word salad, but here are some examples to make it much, much, much more clear. So this is when actually here, wait, who's that Pokemon? It's Luna classic. This is when Luna classic went to zero. Basically, um, this is, th this is what that candle looked like, right? And so what do you think the funding rate looks like for an asset that is rapidly accelerating towards zero? I'm curious. Does anyone in chat? have an idea of what funding rate would look like for an asset that is going to zero. Any ideas? Would it be positive? Would it be negative? Would, what would the funding rate be for an asset that is rapidly heading towards zero? You've got lots of good answers coming in. Bruto 23 negative. Stop floss, negative 1,000%. Gurmail Singh, negative. Fit for life, 22, negative. Exactly, you guys nailed it. The easy way to understand it, that if price is going down, the funding rate will be negative. If price is going up, the funding rate will be positive. That helps you determine the bias of the market. So this actually was an instance where there was a negative 150% APR. That means the annualized fee to short Luna was 150%. So if you, if you are short Luna, a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars over a year, you would have paid $1,500 in fees, $1,500 in fees. And that is because the short side of that Luna trade was very crowded. There was a massive difference. The mark price was significantly significantly lower than the spot price. The spot price was up here. The mark price was significantly lower. So everybody shorting it made the difference bigger, which makes the premium or yeah, the premium even bigger, right? But the other side of this trade was getting paid 150%. I'll call you before newcomer, no teacher. You have a teacher so bad English with English with people. Um, so just like the shorts were paying 150%, the longs, the people who caught the falling knife on Luna, they were making 150% APR on this trade, just with funding rate, just with funding rate. This is why when you hold a perp, you will get a negative fee when price moves one way and a positive fee the other. Exactly. Um, so this is with VLO data. This is the VLO data. So right now there is a 62% premium on Shiba. This was taken December 3rd at 8 PM. And so this funding rate heat map is really useful because you can see where the market is experiencing the highest amount of leverage, where the market is experiencing the highest amount of directional bias, and if it's capturable. So I'm just using the Shiba one as an example, 62%. Well, if it's positive 62% APR, what does this actually mean, right? Who is making 62% on this trade? Who is actually making 62% on this trade? Is it the people who are longing or the people who are shorting? That's the big question. If you see a positive 62% APR, who is making money on that trade? 
Is it longs or is it shorts? What does this actually mean? I swear to God for me, English teacher, white people, Dan. I don't know what this Sava guy is on about. I'm getting fucking lit up. Longs, exactly. Longs are paying shorts. There is a positive premium on this asset, right? Mark price is here, spot price is here. The people who are longing are increasing that difference. So longs are paying shorts. If you see a positive funding rate, that means the market is long bias. If you see a negative funding rate, the market is short bias. Now there's what is called Binance Futures data. Effectively, what this allows you to look at, there's top traders. You can look at them by account. This is the ratio, a very top down look for longs versus shorts. So I pulled this data two days ago, but two days ago, 63% of all accounts were long bias, while 36% of all accounts were short bias. So this allows you to get a closer look at what smart money is doing with their derivatives accounts. The other thing you can look at is their positions, total position value of smart money. So 63% of all percent, 63 percent of all accounts were long, but when you look at their positions, only 55% of them were actually long with their total amount in their account. So this allows you to kind of front run because smart money probably moves first, right? They're called smart money for a reason. Um, and so this allows you to kind of get a better understanding of how smart money is positioning. You can see the ratio if they are bearish, hedging or bullish. And my question to you is what would hedging top, top trader data look like, right? To me, hedging in this instance would look like if we had a top trader bias, if majority of the market was long, if the majority of the market was long, but when you look at their dollar denominated value, it's short, right? That means the majority are long, but they still have quite a bit of value held in shorts. And so now what we're gonna do, we're gonna do some live examples. That was the entire presentation that I had. But what we're gonna do now is we are going to look at Velo data. Bitcoin currently trading $43,442. And we're gonna do some real examples with you guys to get, get a better understanding. So personally, I think Velo data is the best tool, is the best tool for this. So. First, I'm just gonna get a naked chart here. Damn, Bitcoin reached $44,200 on this most recent pump up. Put a little line there, make it easy to see. Make it white, crazy. Um, so we're gonna add an indicator here called funding rate. It's this top one here in Velo data, top one here. Let me readjust my screen a little bit. Alrighty, so we have funding rate. So this, let's zoom out to the four hour. Funding rate has been consistently green, right? Does everyone in chat see this? Funding rate has been consistently green. So does that mean longs are paying a premium or a rebate? If funding rate is green and positive, do people who are long, do they pay a premium or do they get a rebate? That is the question that I'm asking. Funding rate is green, paying a premium, exactly. And so when you see a green funding rate, what does that tell you? Do they think the market is gonna go down or do they think the market is going to go up? If you see a positive funding rate, does that mean the degenerates think the market is going to go down or up? Green funding rate is the market bias to the upside or to the downside ljwb420 420 says up exactly you guys got it you guys are smart right and so as you can see basically for the entire month of november because over here is the end of october over here on the left is the end of october this was all of november the market was incredibly long bias. The market was incredibly long bias. That means all of the degenerates were very long. But now let's go back to a time where this wasn't the case. 
Let's go back to a time where this wasn't the case. Um, there we go. So this is a great example. This is a great example. So over here is when Bitcoin dumped from 30K down to 26. So you can see that Bitcoin broke a major structure. Bitcoin broke a major structure right there. What's up, Carter? What's up? Um, Bitcoin broke a major support. Let's put a vertical line right there. Let's make it white and easy to see. Bitcoin broke a major support right there. Funding rate immediately started trending down. Funding rate immediately started trending down. So over here, the funding rate was green. This means the market was long bias. Bitcoin broke a major support. Price started to fall and the market immediately flipped short. The market immediately flipped short. So in this situation where we now have red funding rate, what does that mean? Does that mean the market is short bias or long bias? My guy, what up, Crypto Gambino? We're just doing a live lecture talking about cryptocurrency derivatives. Bitcoin currently trading $43,600. So in the instance where the funding rate flipped red, that means the derivatives ecosystem suddenly got very bearish, perhaps overly bearish, perhaps overly bearish. So you see these situations where funding rate is flipping between green and red, green and red. These are situations where people are shorting local tops, right? Let's zoom in here. Let's zoom in here. So over the same time frame, that funding rate was green, like, right, let, let's draw a circle here. Funding rate was green, price trended up, price trended up. But then there is this pump right here. There, let's make this a different color. There is this pump right here. Boom. Let's make this blue. Blue. There's this price right here, this pump right here. But then funding rate flipped red. That tells you that people were shorting the pump. People were shorting the pump. When funding rate is red, when funding rate is red as pump is pr as the price is pumping, that tells you people are shorting it. That tells you people are shorting it. That is the context for a squeeze. People, funding rate is red. People are shorting the market. People are bearish. That tells me it's gonna run even higher. And the reason it's gonna run, every, run even higher is because people are selling into strength. People are selling into strength. And then lo and behold, what happened? This was, this was in September. Lo and behold, three days later, we ran up again. We ran up again. People were shorting this pump. Funding rate was red when the price was green. Funding rate was red when the price was green. That is the context for a squeeze. We got a little bit of consolidation and then lo and behold, we made another leg up, right? Another leg up, that was a squeeze. So when there is discrepancy between the directionality of price and the directionality of derivatives, typically context for a squeeze. Typically, very similar story here. So very similar story. So price was rising. Price was rising here, right? We're gonna make this blue. Price was going up. Price was going up. At the same time, funding rate was red. So this tells me Is this Saba person like an NPC? I don't understand. Um, so price was rising at the same time funding rate was red. Funding rate was red. That means people were shorting the pump. They weren't respecting the pump. I'm done with leverage. Every time I make gains, I lose more thereafter. Mexi is rigged. I've actually heard a lot of sus things about Mexi recently. Um, this isn't even really talking about using leverage. This is more so about interpreting the market because honestly y'all should be staying away from leverage probably but because there's 10 times more derivatives being traded than spot and so looking at the volume in my humble opinion is not enough to understand the market it's not enough because the spot volume doesn't tell you anything so 
People were shorting this pump up. Funding rate was red, price was rising. What does that mean? It means a squeeze is coming. And that's exactly what happened. We rallied even harder. People had to cover their shorts. The people who short have to buy eventually. That is a fact. If you sell an asset, you have to buy it eventually. And that's exactly what happened. We squeezed higher. Anytime funding rate has turned red over the last two months, it has not lasted because we just have squeezed our way out of it. Same thing happened here, right? Same thing happened here. People shorted this, people shorted this little, this little pump here, this move, right? People were short and what did they have to do? What did they have to do? Funding rate immediate. Do you see how high funding rate reversed after, right? We went from very low to very positive. That is because all these people had to cover their positions and buy. Cover their positions and buy, which pushed up price even faster. And so now when we look at current price and we see open interest is disgustingly positive, right? Open interest is disgustingly positive. When this house of cards falls, because we are very far up, we're like up shit's creek without a paddle. What I'm telling you is that when the market begins to crash, because there is a lot of leverage accumulated, there is a lot of leverage accumulated, this is going to crash very fast and very hard. Very fast and very hard. Something to think about. Does anyone have any questions? That is pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about. We talked about derivatives. We talked about specifically perpetuals. We talked about open interest. We talked about funding rate. We talked about liquidations. I don't know. Did you guys learn anything at all? Anything at all? Please let me know. Drop it in the chat. Questions, comments, concerns. Was it helpful? Was it not helpful? Because now we can just start talking about crypto. I had my lecture. That was all I wanted to talk about. Ordinals, holy shit. You're always very helpful. Thank you, Crypto Gambino. I hope it was helpful. I don't know. It took me like two hours to build that slideshow. I hope you guys learned something because that's why I did it. Otherwise I wouldn't have, plain and simple. You have this recorded too for Discord? Yeah, so this entire live stream is going to be recorded and then I will just post the specific derivatives section uh, on YouTube later. I don't know. You are a very good teacher. Thank you so much. Can never have enough knowledge. Love your content, man. Appreciate all your knowledge and insight. Thank you guys. I'm glad it was useful.